The Nevada Chronomaster has been with me for two months, and before it makes its way back home to Switzerland, I thought I would expand on part one and talk about the things that have stood out to me. Who is this watch for, the pros and cons, and also ask one question about this piece that either makes it or breaks it. If you haven't seen part one, I will link it in the corner of the screen, but it's a lot more specific around dimensions and proportions and how the watch wears and things that stood out to me, especially over the course of a week of wearing it. The main thing that hasn't changed is that proportions, build quality, tactility, the feel of this is incredible. It's so refreshing having a smaller sized watch on the wrist again. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been wearing 41 to 43 millimeter watches on a daily basis. And getting this back on the wrist again, it's like going back in a time machine. You know, the accuracy of everything, the bezel, the lugs, just how it sits on the wrist gives you this distinct feeling it's a watch from another time. The primary question that needs to be asked about Nevada watches is, who is their audience? And it's pretty easy to understand. Either those who appreciate the vintage originals or those who love the dynamism of these models, who likes the kinds of watches that are a part of this new reissue genre, but also are watches that can be worn every day that aren't going to be damaged by day-to-day -day wear. I should also say that a piece like this should be for the younger watch owner, not necessarily those with aging eyes. Even for my young eyes, I do struggle to see some of the elements on the dial because of its proportions. This is the issue of being one-to-one -one scale accurate. It's exact, and because it's a watch of that time, things have come a long way since then. So it's established. You need to be someone who loves vintage, someone who loves reissue pieces, someone who prefers smaller watches. Also a watch that offers something unique that many others don't offer you. And that is the all-in-one series of features. GMT, chronograph, dive watch, racing watch, regatta timer. Something I didn't address too much in the first part, which I think is relevant now after wearing the piece and getting the chance to talk more about it. It is an extremely strange design, and this can't be understated. Yes, it does look like an instrument, but at the same time, it feels less aesthetically focused and a lot more functionally focused. This is true and very relevant when we look to the 1960s. But I think what I also like about this watch is that it is not a people pleaser. It's not one watch to do it all for everyone. And unfortunately today, going down the path of talking about how modern design is very generic in a lot of circumstances, this is a watch you can look down to and appreciate for its outlandish approach. Put yourself in the shoes of those designers. Let us address the one element that has defined this watch for me, that is the broad arrow hand. I don't know why more brands don't use this. It's timeless, it's also direct, it doesn't have any kind of timeline associated, like other designs, it's not something that ages and still looks relevant now. One of the main pieces of feedback I received on part one of the series was that a couple of owners said that they would trade their Speedmasters to get a watch like this, purely because of that broad arrow hand, because it in a way captures a different, vibrant kind of style, but still has a few of those Rodania Omega qualities to its arrangement. What I also appreciate greatly, which is often overlooked, even though it is a broad arrow hand on the dial, it does not get in the way of the subdials. It's purposefully been made to be short. The result, it gives you great legibility from a distance, but also doesn't get in the way of the rest of the dial. After wearing larger watches on the wrist over the last few weeks, another thing that I truly appreciate is the size of the chronograph pushes. They are scaled so nicely, fit with the form of the watch. There is never a time when you think this piece shouts about its presence or makes its presence known. And that is something that we can appreciate. A great criticism that's also come forward is that the subdials appear very spaced apart. And this has to do with not only the proportions on the dial, but also just how these were arranged back in the day. It's not something that's ever affected the wearing experience. And just like having the shorter hour hand, reading the time and using the chronograph separately is extremely easy. Another thing to highlight is that red accent on the right subdial is incredibly subtle, but works so well. This next part of the review, I want to look at its relevance, especially from a size perspective, and if it meets the criteria today. If we think of modern sizes, virtually every watch in this zone generally sits at 39 millimeters. This is because hindsight has helped a lot with the further development of these pieces, and maybe a lot of these manufacturers have realized that a slightly larger size allows for better legibility, as well as increased presence. This can be important when you're dealing with something as busy, as technical as a chronograph. 
And for that reason, a watch like this will offer a great point of difference, but it is also polarizing. I still stand firmly on what I said in the first part about how great it is that this brand gives you everything. It doesn't give you any instructions on how to use it. It's up to you to determine when the best chances would be to operate the watch. Whether or not you are someone who's interested in using the GMT or the chronograph or the dive bezel or just using it as a simple time only. And what has made an experience with a watch like this so refreshing is that you have all of these gadgets to play with. You find yourself often turning the friction bezel because it feels so great and it's just something to do. It comes across as this utility that you would see on the wrist of a professional, but then also has a level of playfulness to it. It's really hard to define. But this is the underlying question that I have to ask, which is the main crux of this piece. Being a jack of all trades and master of none. Does this watch have too much and is too much of something a bad thing? We have to understand that most watches are built today to fall into criterias. There are some exceptions, but the majority of pieces are categorized as dive watches, GMTs, chronographs, etc. What happens, and this is why corporations are so brilliant, as enthusiasts, we want to experience these different complications, preferably out of separate watches. So we go and look at every single brand and find a handful of pieces that do represent the complication the best. This essentially allows us to enjoy more watches and to diversify our tastes, giving us that chance to experience more brands and to fixate on one component that they offer really well. With a piece like this, if you aren't someone who is necessarily an enthusiast, this could easily be your one watch because it is the kind of watch that can give you a slice of everything in a well-assembled package. On the other hand, if you are a die-hard enthusiast, someone who loves vintage reissue watches, this is the kind of watch for you because it gives you so much to play with and it's just fun. But then from a design perspective, if we eliminate everything else, if we eliminate the nostalgia and the fact that it's been so well built, does this piece actually resonate well as an example of a watch that was built with a specific purpose, or is it a piece that was created through the process of wearing a blindfold and throwing darts at the dartboard? If I was being more critical about the design of this watch, I would tell you straight up that it doesn't know what it is. It doesn't make sense. The first and last nail in the coffin is that it calls itself Chronomaster Aviator Sea Diver. And if this review was being made 50 years ago, I would probably be telling you that. It doesn't have a direct purpose or a direct goal. But since we are now looking at these watches today with nostalgia, rose-tinted glasses, as enthusiasts, it's a completely different ballgame. And we can admire them because they don't follow this linear path like so many other pieces do. They have character, they have grit, they put a smile on your face. So yes, if I take the watch enthusiast out of me and I critique this from a pure design perspective, this would get very low marks because the primary rule of industrial design is to address problems with practical solutions. And when you're dealing with the product, the last thing you want to do is give your consumer every opportunity. You should diversify, offer a range of watches to get more money from your customer. It's as simple as that. So I have grown very fond of this watch, as I thought I would. As someone who loves to wear smaller watches, but more than that, someone who loves to look at pieces and question the thought process that went into them, this is the kind of watch that is infinitely fascinating because you're often drawn back to think about its position, to think about the kind of person who would have bought this watch back then, and to those of us now who appreciate them because they decided to go against the status quo. I think the owner of this watch would be incredibly happy, especially because it still has things like an aluminium bezel insert. It's still going to age so gracefully over the next couple of decades. It uses a bulletproof workhorse movement and makes for such a great companion piece. Something that you could wear traveling the world very easily or in a different situation while wearing a suit and tie. It's the kind of watch that makes you feel like Don Draper. A watch from the 1960s that had advertising push it as much as possible and it became a great success in the United States. With a design that harkens back to 1950s motifs but still today remains as an example of a smart watch belonging to that time. A sophisticated little design, one that has provenance of being on the wrist of Jacques Cousteau and a piece that will always make for great conversation.